the Florida Podcast Network, the voice of Florida. From Mallory Square in Key West to the Governor's Mansion in Tallahassee and all points beyond, you're listening to the Florida Beer Podcast, powered by FloridaBeerBlog.com. Your source for all things related to the craft beer community in the Sunshine State. And now your host, Dave Butler. Welcome to a fun, information-filled episode of the Florida Beer Podcast, powered by FloridaBeerBlog.com. This is Dave, your host and author. We've got a lot to get to, so we're just going to jump right into it. And we're going to talk about orangutans and chimpanzees and the like. For the past 30 years, the Center for Great Apes in Hardy County, Florida, has been taking care of rescued chimpanzees and orangutans from private homes that can no longer care for them, medical facilities, the entertainment industry, and so on. As part of their exciting 30th anniversary, not only are they going to be doing some great exhibits and informational events around the Miami area. They are also partnering with Miami Brewery Tripping Animals. This is a fun, fun project based around three completely different beers, each one which is named for one of the residents at the Center for Great Apes, a couple of which are celebrities, let's be honest, and featuring artwork from those particular residents as well. There's a lot to get to, so we're going to be speaking with Ignacio Montenegro. He is the co-founder of Tripping Animals Brewery, and Jane Watkins from the Center for Great Apes as well. Here we go. Enjoy. Ignacio. You have not been on the podcast yet. We have definitely featured tripping animals on Florida Beer Blog before, but if you could just give us a good quick rundown of the incredible brewery that you have in Miami. Well, man, thank you so much for having us here today. Um, and it's very exciting to be doing what we're doing and to have this type of reason to be talking to you today besides just the brewery. But let me talk to you a little bit about the brewery. Yes. We are about to tour five years in November, which is pretty exciting. And yeah, man, we are, a, it's a family business owned that, that four family owns stripping animals and each family has a member, which are my friends and family also. We have been together since before we opened the brewery and it's been five beautiful years and hasn't been easy, you know, going through a, through a pandemic in the mm-hmm. middle. It was a very challenging times, but and we still are. But but it's been a hell of a ride. You know, the community in South Florida and Florida in general uh, have been amazing with us. And that's something that you know we feel that we have to give back also if if we can use our platform in any kind of way to not only support the community but do things like kind of like what we're doing with with the center. With the sanctuary, and I think it's a beautiful thing, you know. That's awesome. And Jane, can you give us a good rundown of the Center for Great Apes? Because I will admit, I was not totally familiar with this organization. Well, it, I'm not surprised you're not totally familiar because it is a private, nonprofit, true sanctuary for orangutans and chimpanzees. So what that means is that we're not there. It's not there for the entertainment of humans. It's there for the care and enrichment and well-being of the apes that it has rescued. So members, people who are members get to go twice a year. Or if you book a private tour and it requires a donation, you can go. So it's, it is not, it's nothing like a, a, this is but not a zoo. It's not a zoo. It's not an attraction. It is, they really truly are there to take care of these animals in the best way possible. And where do these animals come from? What, what has happened to them to where they end up in your care? 
So the animals have been rescued or retired from the entertainment industry, from roadside attractions, from the exotic pet trade. A lot of the apes were once pets and they quickly grow to be way too strong to make stay as a pet research in lab look, laboratories. So from different situations, they've come to the sanctuary. And even some other places have closed, like a group of eight chimpanzees came to the sanctuary from California because unfortunately a sanctuary out there closed and, you know, with the risk of wildfires and other situations, they needed to be rescued. So the sanctuary in Florida and the Center for Great Apes built new habitats, new places for them to live, and then brought them over um, quickly. I think it, it it was one of the fastest construction projects we had. Interesting. Do they require a lot of care over and above what a, a orangutan or chimpanzee would need? Do they come with a lot of health issues or maybe even, I guess, psychological issues? Definitely. Past That's life? Com- That's an amazing question. They absolutely have issues that they need to work through. You know, they've been some of the chimpanzees who have I've met there, I mean, been introduced to, like seen there, think they're humans or they don't recognize other chimpanzees because they've been born in a facility given to a human and always interacted with humans. So when they come to the sanctuary, and they see other chimpanzees, it it can be a little much for them. So the introductions take longer, the the getting used to, you know, you're not drinking soda, you're not eating garbage, you have to eat a healthy diet. They get three really healthy meals a day with veggies and fruits and and whatever their nutritional needs are. Each ape has a different specific diet based on their situation. And then they get snacks and stuff. So their their life changes dramatically and for the better. They have a lot more space. They have a lot more enrichment. They're highly, highly intelligent animals. So enrichment every day is very important to keep them mentally stimulated and happy. And then also exercise. There's a lot of play going on. Yeah, it's a total change for them. And then health-wise, definitely the the apes that come from research and biomedical, there's a lot of potential health situations that will come up. And that, you know, the range for caring for an ape ranges from $25,000 a year to thirty five, forty thousand, dollars depending on which ape you're talking about. They, you know, they're on different medications, they have different health needs, they've gotten different things that they're dealing with. But we've got an, an amazing veterinarian team and a, an amazing team of caregivers who are so incredible. So it's they're they're living a good life at the Center for Great Eggs. That's amazing. And since you are celebrating your 30th anniversary, how difficult has it been to sort of spread the word on the things that you are doing at the facility and get the support and obviously get the backing and with the things that you need? The the this Center for Great Eggs does raises funds through donations, memberships, and grants. It does not receive any government funding. It doesn't, you know, it's it just depends on people to support it. And we try and increase membership and awareness through the good work that they do. The team at the sanctuary, they are 100% focused on the apes. So it's volunteers like myself and other members and, and the board members to to talk to other people and talk to great people like you and your listeners to get the word out. Awesome. And so since you are celebrating the 30th anniversary and there are some events that are coming up and we definitely want to talk about those, but there are beers at the center of those events. And so I guess my first question with that is, how did that conversation come about and how did this project really get started so i love to eat great food and one of my favorite restaurants is key indian kitchen in miami mm-hmm. and the owners of that restaurant and their restaurant group alperino they own a couple other restaurants orno and meme also in miami and i noticed that they were carrying these beers with really insane labels on it and then 
all of a sudden they had their own beer with their label on it. And so I asked Shivani Patel, the one of the owners about it, and she told me all about tripping animals and stuff. And I was just, and the beer is fantastic. And it's called Foragers and you can get it at those restaurants. And so I asked Shivani to introduce me to them because I wanted tripping animals to consider donating cases for our events coming up. And they said, no, they said, we can do better. We want to do better. Come meet with us. And so we met and here we are. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Hey, hey, Ignacio, yeah. What did you think when you first heard uh, this come down the pipeline? Excuse me. Can you repeat that, please? What did you think when you first heard about this organization and what they were wanting to do? No, I'm going to be honest. We were skeptical at the beginning. So we were like, I, I'd rather meet. I would love to meet in person because as as we know, there is a lot of organizations out, out there that are not doing as true or are not so legitimate like this organization is. So we wanted just to make sure and we wanted to meet them and, and, and make sure like we have the same, you know, same visions when it comes to, to working and, and doing the right things. And guess what? It was even better than we thought. So that's why we took it to the next level. To, to the next level, we were like, "Oh, donation is something that we can easily do." But I think it's important to all for us to take it to the next level and, and and create a bigger awareness when it comes to the to the sanctuary and let the people know what these humans out there are doing, which is an amazing thing, and and also create. You know, awareness, yeah, of, of what's happening to these animals. So again, as I said before, if we can use our platform to create this awareness, we're a hundred percent down. And I think the, the, the connection with, with Jane and, and the, and the entire crew from the center, it was a hundred percent positive. So we decided to do three different beers for them. Awesome. And I guess with the beers, did the so each beer is named actually why don't you go ahead and describe the inspiration behind not just the beer's names but also the label art which is a very big part of this particular project yeah it is huge art for us is always a big part of the process besides just doing the recipe and making beer which is obviously the main thing for our business of all what we do and what we love the most we also love art we put a lot of hours and a lot of effort of making an, an amazing labels who, who can be, you know, like we have, it's like, we, we call it like, it's, it's a white canvas and we can express ourselves or what we feel to, to the labels. And in this case, to be honest, we were like, let's choose one of the, 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 the chimpanzees or, or the orangutan from the, from the center as the main characters of each label. But then Jay was mentioning that they're, that they're actually artists too and that they paint. And that really caught our attention. We were like, well, guess what? We have to see this painting. We have to see what they're doing because I think it will be amazing to even collaborate in the label. So this collaboration come from our marketing team uh, and our art director, David Leon, did the, we drew the animals and the background of the label is actually the are the art pieces that are done by the by the chimpanzees by by the apes? It, uh, Jane, is this something that they enjoy doing as part of their enrichment? So yeah, it is part of their enrichment program, and they not all the apes love to paint, but a lot of the apes love to paint. So Bubbles, he's he loves 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 to paint, and they and also Keegan, the orangutan, she. She and she's in a group with other orangutans. So she's in with a three year old Kahaya, Kahaya's mom, Sunshine and Sunshine, Keegan's brother, Archie. So they're all in this one big space and they all kind of get involved in the painting together. So it's a, a lot of fun. That's cool. um, but you, it is really when you see pictures of them or videos of them painting and, and I, I can send you some pictures of Bubbles painting. You can see like they're really paying attention. They're really engaged. Bubbles, when he's painting, he's not going to give you back the canvas until he's done. <laughs> so it's, it's super amazing. 
And and I feel like I feel remiss. I do have to mention that when we are talking about bubbles, we are talking about the bubbles. We are talking about uh, Michael Jackson's former pet chimpanzee, the bubbles that we all know. You are right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So obviously that was because not only the name recognition, but because Bubbles is such a prolific painter, that was an obvious get. And sounds like Keegan is kind of brings in the whole family when it comes to his canvas. Who's the third resident whose artwork you are featuring? featuring? Uh, Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Jacob is, he's from the entertainment world. In fact, he and his twin were, Jonah, were in Planet of the Apes with Mark Wahlberg. Okay. And so they came to the Center for Great Apes from the entertainment world when a trainer retired. And so he's on the, the third label. He's on what kind of beer is he on? He's in a sour. He's in a sour. Oh my gosh. These beers are so amazing, fantastic and delicious. And I, I think you should ask Ignacio, like how they came up because they, they're not just labeling pre existing beers, they custom made each beer. Yeah. This project. Well, that is the next question, Ignacio. How did you decide what inspired the recipes for each of these beers? Well, man, it, it, there is a lot that, I mean, it's, it's a lot that plays in the role when, when we're de- designing or, or creating a recipe alongside with the art. I mean, in this case, we had the painting from the, from the apes and we have the drawing from the bead which is the picture of the ape. And through the coloring and through the vibe that we felt, we decided that which ape, I mean, which beer is going to be represented by which apes. And Keegan, we receive a lot of vibes of something very refreshing, as it seems in the picture and in the art. So we decided to go with a lager, a very like easy going lager for everybody. It's, I believe it's a 5% ABB. And then Jacob, Jacob was special because the type of art that, that Jacob did and the coloring on, on the art, it was very fluid. It was very fluid for us. So we decided to go with the sour on Jacob. The fruits that we're using on this specific beer are fruits that they typically eat. Like okay. it's on their diets. So for us, it was very important to make sure like the fruits that we were choosing is something that they enjoy too. That's amazing. And then um, bubbles, being bubbles, as like <laughs> as everybody knows, like everybody knows bubbles, and we yeah. feel like it's it's like it's one of the main stars, but you know, because because of his background. Since everybody knows bubble, we decided to go with an IPA and something hobby, since hoppiness and and, and, and IPAs are those beers that everybody into craft enjoy the most. That's awesome. In terms of release, because it's so for great. Let me oh. just add really quick. Bubbles Art has some orange on it. Uh-huh. That really, it reminds us a lot of, of uh, AC IPA with those tones, with those citrusy flavors and orangey. So we decided to go with Bubbles as, as our hobby guy. That's awesome. Now, since the Center for Great Apes is in Hardy County, which is about hour, hour and a half south of Lakeland, the center of the state, will you be releasing these beers for distribution statewide? Are they only going to be in the tap room? What is the sort of footprint going to look like for this release? Again, as I mentioned before, we are trying to create awareness and trying to support to support the, the center the most. So mm-hmm. basically, we are donating a proceed. For every case sold, a proceed of that is going to be donated to, to to the center. So we are going statewide. Nationwide. Okay. Nationwide. Nation- yeah, yeah. Sorry. Nationwide. Yeah. Oh, nice. Nationwide. Yeah. So, no. First, we're going to start in the top room, but then it's going to grow statewide okay. and then nationwide. Yeah. The idea is to go and spread the word all, all over, all over the nation. Awesome. And there are three events that are coming up that feature the Center for Great Apes and the beers as part of the 30th anniversary. Can you tell us a little bit about those events? So the, there's three orangutans and three chimpanzees who have artwork that will be shown at 
three different locations around Miami. In October, it will be at Books and Books in the Gables. And I it'll love be Books and month. Books. Yeah, yeah, it's so great. It'll be there all month, but the opening reception will be October 6th at 7 p.m. And the founder of the Center for Great Apes, Patty Reagan, will be there. And team members from Tripping Animals will be there. So it's going to be incredible. On November 10th, we're going to have the party at Tripping Animals. Different art by the same apes will be here. And the art that will be at Tripping Animals will include the originals that you see on the labels of the three beers. So you'll have, we'll have three chimpanzees and three orangutan pieces here and including the originals of the ones on the beer labels. And they're for sale, of course. December 7th. It'll be at the Works Gallery. We'll have a gallery exhibit there all month. And then the reception is December 7th, starting at 5.30 p.m. and going to 7.30 p.m. And Tripping Animals is sponsoring the bar there. So that will be a good one. And that's the day or two before Art Basel and Art Miami Week starts. So people can go really crazy. And there's one more event. Oh, it's, well, two more events. October 20th at Gay Indian Kitchen in, in Miami. Okay. They're doing anyone who orders the tasting menu, they will donate the proceeds to the Center for Great Apes. So this is huge. You can make your reservations on open table. Just make a note. So that's December 20th. Anytime for dinners between six and nine, nine thirty. And mm-hmm. also we'll have representatives from the Center for Great Apes from there at that event to talk to anyone who wants to talk. And the entire Gi team is going to the sanctuary to do a tour before that dinner so they can also talk as informed supporters of the sanctuary about what it's like to be there. That's and then amazing. also, it's you know, Ignacio and his team at Trip, Tripping Animals, when they do their due diligence, they insisted on seeing the sanctuary and making sure it was everything we said it was. And mm. they did. They came up. We had a great tour. They were impressed. They got to see Keegan and Bubbles and Jacob and, and, and the whole sanctuary. So it was really, they're an incredible company that takes their philanthropic work seriously and are a great partner. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If people are interested in getting more information about the events, about the beers, and definitely about the Center for Great Apes, where is the best place for them to go? So if people have Facebook, they could go to Facebook and go to the events. They're all there. And then also you could go to centerforgreatapes.org and go to the news page. I think it's when it's around Learn More. And there's a, a document there with all the events listed there. And then also, we're, if you sign up for the email newsletter for Center for Great Apes and for Tripping Animals, we will be sending out a email newsletter announcing, you know, hey, here's mark your calendars. Here's everything that's going on. People should sign up for the newsletters anyway, because there's always something going on at Tripping Animals. And then for <laughs> the Center for Great Apes, it's always good to keep in the loop on what's happening. Also, if, if you go to Tripping Animals Instagram, or even Facebook, we have a link which is which will take you to our link tree, and in the link tree we have a lot of different links, and that takes you to different directions. And then you will see, and you can go through to the link that will take you to a center website where you can have all the information, and you can see all the information about the the events that we're doing and that they're doing also. Awesome. Thank you both so much for your time. I appreciate it. And I cannot wait to to try the beers and check out the artwork for myself. Sounds good. Sounds like a plan. So those events sound like an absolutely great time. A uh, great way to see some of the artwork that these particular apes have created, which I did not realize was such a big thing for them. Excited to see that and obviously try some amazing beers and raise funds for the center as well. From there, we're going to be heading over to Tampa and Ulele. This is one of my favorite restaurants that are owned by the Columbia Restaurant Group, but they use sort of a pre-Columbian 
Floridian inspiration with their foods. They also have a full, amazingly prolific brew house headed up by master brewer Tim Shackton. I have not been able to get him on the podcast just yet, but I have spoken with him a number of times and he's been on the blog several times because his beers are absolutely phenomenal. And starting last week, they tapped a beer called Dry Fall, sort of to celebrate the end of summer and the autumnal equinox. It is an interesting combination of a caramel forward Mertzen with a New England IPA. It, there's a lot going on, and I think Tim is better suited to talk about it than I am. So here is Tim Shackton, brewmaster at Ulele in Tampa, talking about their new beer, Dry Fall. Tim, big friend of the podcast, big friend of the show. Thank you so much for joining us. I do appreciate it. How have the past several years been at Eulalie? Have you been able to really connect with Tampa's discerning craft beer audience? Oh, I, I, I've been in a situation where we have touched upon the craft beer movement in a deep way. And in particular, having the real estate that we have right on the Tampa's Riverwalk it affords you lately the unique opportunity of attracting people who would otherwise not be craft beer enthusiasts. And those people that would not be predisposed to walk into a craft brewery that stand alone. We offer this Bib Gourmand listed restaurant in this beautiful facility, this historic building and with a lot of public access points. So people of many walks of life come to our tap room, sometimes thousands a day. And because of that, I get to touch upon people and to put beer on the table and take somebody who would not otherwise drink the product and turn them to the craft side. So uh, the last few years has been, if if you want to say that the... Overall, if I wanted to put my finger on the pulse of what's been going on, I use it in relation to the average person that would walk into Eulalie. And the strength of Eulalie's brewery is that it is not one individual component. With all of this other, uh, all of the other world class offerings that we're able to provide, we're able to. I believe help in growing the craft beer base, guest that's, by guest at the table. That's awesome. And so obviously you've got an amazing menu. I particularly love the the chili that you have, and you've got a fantastic lineup of beers coming out of your brew house. But well, we're going to talk about one beer in particular. And mm-hmm. to get into Dry Fall, before we talk about what it is, I'd like to talk about why it is because it's being released to sort of celebrate the autumnal equinox. Can you give us a quick rundown of what that is and why you and you, Laylee, decided to celebrate it this year the way that you are? Well, there's a couple things as the years have gone by. You know, we've brewed dry fall before, and I can get into the nuts and bolts of how and why it's come to where it's come to. But, you know, every year at this time, there is usually a strong push in bars and in breweries all across the city to celebrate Oktoberfest Absolutely. and the fall season. You know, like, yeah, and I'm sure you've heard those same arguments before about all the brewers saying, you know, well, we've got to make our pumpkin beer or mm-hmm. got to release this and that. And all of a sudden we have to get the leader hosing out. And, you know, I, I kept thinking to myself, well, hold on a second. Tampa has its own craft beer identity. So why don't we render unto Munich that which is Munich's? And then if we're going to have something to celebrate, it doesn't necessarily have to be Oktoberfest. It could, but perhaps we should celebrate something more fundamentally important to the people of the city of Tampa. And in my opinion, very strongly, I believe that to be 
the end of summer, right? Okay. So you have a situation where it happens every year. It could be a, a big storm blows through right at this time of year, or it could just be you wake up one morning and you come out and you say, wow, it's not 95 degrees out anymore. Maybe it's Personally, eight. with Tampa, I'd be remiss to say at the beginning of hockey season. Yes, that's another sign of the new change. But you go out and you say, it's not that hot anymore. And there's a little less humidity. And, and boy, is that a good thing? Because people run their air conditionings all summer long. It's blistering heat sometimes in the summer with massive humidity. And for literally two months, it's almost becomes oppressive. And people have a hard time going outside. So it's that very first day. And sometimes it's less than 24 hours that it happens. And it more often than not happens in centers around that autumn equinox, right? And so I figure why I, the idea would be Oktoberfest is good, but I think we should celebrate that end of summer and focus on that in relation to the entire city. Why can't people get behind the idea of doing something different, right? Okay. No, absolutely. And so that's kind of what I, my, a lot of times, how does it come to this, you know? Well, as is the case with a lot of my motivation for beer or anything, a lot of things happen quite by chance. When I first set upon the course to make this beer, Many years ago, it originally was designed to be a true Oktoberfest style. Well, and, maybe when you, and when you say Oktoberfest, are you talking about the, the Märzen or the Fest beer? Märzen. Okay. I, actually, more of a hybrid. I wanted to, I took a blend. I kind of wanted that malt sweetness of the Munich malt. Mm hmm. So wanted to lend credence to the Vienna malt, which, by the way, ironically, was the original malt, right? The Viennese came up with this to make their lager, and the Munich brewers were so horribly jealous that they had to come up with Munich malt. Uh -huh. So I said, let's take a couple of, uh, let's take a, 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 a percentage of each malt, because I want the toast, and I want that sweetness in the lager. So I, that's what originally motivated me to make the dry fall beer. I didn't call it dry fall at first. I said, I wanted to do something a little bit different, right? Not to, you know, I, I like to beat the march to the beat of my own drum. So as it went down the pike and we got out of primary fermentation into cold storage, I realized there was something missing. Okay. And Something was missing. This is quite a few years ago. As a matter of fact, before New England IPA really came upon the scene. And uh -huh. what was it that was missing in the beer? There was something like, this happens with Chef all the time. We'll stand in front of a kettle and we'll taste something and he'll be like, something's missing. What is it? And we'll go for 20 minutes. You know, what is it? <laughs> you know, is it more salt? Is it more seasoning? I do the same thing as a, a brewer, you know, with my beer. And it, it got to a point in the process where I said, what can I add? And at the moment, at that time, I spoke with my hop vendor. And of course, they, I said, send me your best hops. I don't care how much they cost. I don't care where they're grown. I want you to send me the best quality hop that you have in your warehouse. Mm -hmm. And of course, at that time, Galaxy was the rage, yeah. right? So he slid across a couple boxes of T90 Galaxy pellets, and I was like, oh, wow. Oh, boy, I love these. And I, I, I was motivated by change. So one morning I came in and I just decided, you know what? I'm going to open up the top of that tank, and I'm just going to drop some pellets in it, and we're just going to see what happens. And that's and amazing because I have never heard of anybody hopping to any extent, anything either Meritzen or Fest beer. Yeah, well, I I decided I wanted something different. I was willing to take a chance, and I it was based upon my 
years of experience and saying, this might be an aggressive move. What's the worst thing that could happen? I dumped 15 barrels of beer. That's not the end of the world. But at the end of the day, I said, my brewing philosophy is very simple. If you use the highest quality raw materials and you're emphatically focused on the process, it becomes incredibly hard to make a poor quality beer. Mm -hmm. I walked into it knowing, all right, I'm going to drop this and see what happens. And of course, after a couple of days when those beautiful pellets dissolved into that awesome beer, it just, it, it, took that flavor profile up like a hundred notches, <laughs> right? You all of a sudden, you had you had this mix that was the best of both worlds. You, you had the toasty, malty crispness of the beer, almost confounded with the introduction of this radical introduction of passion fruit and gooseberry and citrus on the front end. And then you had a long, it, it, it it's kind of like my wedding beer, right? My mixed berry yeah. lager, where you have the fruit up front, but it finishes almost crisp. Well, you have this Oktoberfest slash Vienna lager, and it starts out with this burst of hop activity on the palate. I mean, it just flashes like a meteor across the sky of your palate. And then at the end of the day, in the aftertaste, you're going to get this wonderful kiss of toasty maltiness. It's just reminiscent of the fall season. And that's what happened when I made it the first year. I haven't been able to make it every year because the hops haven't been available every year. Mm -hmm. so now that I've gotten the set of hops that I want, which is a little bit more than just the galaxy, I've got multiple types of hops in there now. I'd like to tell people that it's a Vienna lager or a Martzen that drinks a little like a hazy, right? You're going to get those hop oils up front, and you're going to get that burst of fruit that's driven by the oils of the hops. And then it's going to cascade into the aftertaste and finish of that traditional cold fermented blend of Munich and Vienna malt. So that's... And that's a good question because, you know, like you said before, at the beginning of the interview, you kind of bringing people into beer that wouldn't necessarily be beer drinkers. And then you present them with something like this. How difficult is it to sell dry fall to somebody who isn't necessarily a beer drinker? Well, the beautiful thing at, is I have this wonderful tool at my disposal, right? I have this productive tap room, and we currently do not package for distribution. So with thousands of people coming in a day, I come in and I, all I have to do is pour from the faucet. And I, I can just let, I, I, I tell people a lot. I tell the story of dry fall a lot. And then ultimately, it, it's just like everything that I do to launch a campaign for a beer. It's, it all comes down to just taste the beer. Tell me what you, <laughs> you like it, if you like it, if you don't. Let me tell you one of the hardest lessons to learn as a brewer. I, I remember one day I thought I made the perfect beer. You know, I was going to take over the world, right? Oh, we're going to, this is the best beer. It'll be the next best beer in the world. And I put it on tap at Eulalie. And of course, the guests were like, yeah, it's okay. Oh. Right? <laughs> That's the hardest lesson to learn right there. But the, it, it, the thing is, is you, you, you you never really know for sure. You have to mix a little bit of what your own vision of what a beer should be and couple that with the severe importance. And I am not understating that, the severe importance of what the guest is responding to. And because that's ultimately what's going to protect you as a brewer is that one sacred moment which cannot be replicated. That moment when the glass comes across the table and it's empty and the hand comes out for another beer. Yeah. You're doing that. You're in, you're doing business and that's all that matters. <laughs> nice. Have you been able to speak with the chef at Ulele to get some beer, some beer and food pairings where Dryfall will work very well with what's coming on the menu? 
Oh, yes, indeed. As a matter of fact, we're planning, currently planning a beer, a couple, more than one beer dinner um, around the launch of this beer, plus variations of this beer that could potentially go into, uh, into a bourbon barrels that would be cold stored. So there's a lot of different things. And I, you know what? That's the other power of Eulalie's Brewery is I have this wonderful world-class chef right? And I walk into that big gourmand listed restaurant and I sit down with the chef or sometimes we're just standing at a counter at a prep table and he's chopping something up and he's talking about what he wants to do. Or else I'll take a beer that's under fermentation and I'll, I'll run it by him. And the, the palate of a sh- an executive chef, while uh, on a professional level, is mm-hmm. just as clinical as a brewer or a brewmaster. The thing is, is when you when you throw those ideas um, out to a chef like that, you get a completely different take, right? Than just sitting at a table of brewers. So all of a sudden, you're opening your eyes to a whole different world, and that world opens up for me every single day when I walk into the into Ulele. We get to talk about what pairs well, what we could be planning for the, the new season, what's coming off the boats, what's coming out of the fields, what's the best quality hop, are there new ideas coming out of the industry, mm-hmm. you know, what are guests saying at the table about certain things, but more importantly, what do we want to put at the table? And it's usually centered around several things, but at the end of the day, we have one similar philosophy, and that is whatever we put on the table needs to achieve one objective alone, and that is to bring the plate closer to you. And that, and when you identify with beer in that way, you don't think of it just as craft beer. You think of it as a cultural phenomenon, a social beverage. You think of it much differently than you would be perhaps more one-dimensional if it were any other situation. That's awesome. So by the time this episode gets released, you will have dry fall tapped. How long do you expect it to stick around? <laughs> well, I w- with the launching today, officially, the autumn equinox, we're going to try to carry it until the very first strawberry harvest. And that that's usually sometime around Christmas, before or after the new year, when those first beautiful luscious plant city strawberries come out of the ground. And then what happens is if we have any dry fall inventory left over, it goes into barrel into the cold room. And oh, it, uh, and then we focus exclusively on the launching of our honeymoon lager, which is by far our most popular seasonal because it's in, in, infused with the direct uh, strawberry pulp, keg by keg. And uh, it's hugely popular. We'll carry that beer from Christmas through St. Patrick's Day. Mm-hmm. And there's a schedule every three or four months. I'll come in big and strong and with a beer. And, and the beautiful thing about dry fall and honeymoon lager and all these other beers is I don't want to think inside the box. I want to think about what is the name of the beer? How can I effectively deploy this beer to such an effect that it impacts the community in a proper way. And how does that jive with the conditions of the industry, right? Like, what is my vision, right? So if my vision is to make a fresh product and to put it on the table and pair it with a dozen charbroiled oysters or a drier wet aged steak or something like that, then like I said, we we think about things a little bit differently. But if we go in every three or four months and we have a beer that we can get behind and celebrate, what will happen is the tap room and the restaurant in general is happier as a result because it's not just like an individual barrel of 50 gallons that I could sell in a single afternoon. So we'll do one-off different beers of smaller scale from time to time. But I usually carry about six beers on the menu year round, and I focus on one seasonal that's tied to the table, like dry fall is. Gotcha. Uh, To to finish up, where would be the best place for somebody who's interested in you, Lily, and the beers that you have on this amazing schedule that you have? 
uh, to find out what's new and what's going to be fresh when they arrive on whenever they go? Well, I would encourage people to go to um, our website. We also have a Facebook, Instagram. Uh, Eulalie is, is very appropriately managed by the most wonderful marketing team that I could possibly have. Mm-hmm. I would say also, we typically say to people, a lot of times you just have to get out of the house and go take a nice walk on the river walk. And if you get to that stretch right at the north end, and as the sun starts to set and you look over to your right and you, you see the tanks, you say, what's that over there? Well, come on in because we've got 4,000 gallons of beer and I'll be more than happy to pour you a sample. We'll walk you through the brewery. I'll get to show you the artwork at Eulalie, which is world famous. And, you know, we get to walk through this building and describe the history that predates Western man. And to be able to just walk these hallowed halls and, and to enjoy it, enjoy it with your family, you know, birthdays, anniversaries. Those are the moments for me that make our business, that makes me think that we'll be brewing here 100 years from now, is knowing that we have people come back year after year for their anniversary every year like clockwork and that we could be such a special part of that, you know? That's awesome. I definitely cannot wait to get back there. It is one of my absolute favorite restaurants in the state of Florida, beer or no beer, but the beer is definitely a huge part of it. Tim Shackton, brewmaster at Eulalie in Tampa. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Anytime, friend. All right. So here we go with another episode of the podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Next week, we're going to be in Ocala. I know I promised it going to be this week. Had to step aside for a little bit to get some of this amazing information out to you all. But I promise we will be back on track next week. In the meantime, if you are looking for information about anything that we've talked about here on the podcast, make sure to follow us on social media at Florida Beer Blog on Instagram, Threads, and X. On Facebook, we are still FL Beer Blog. And you can obviously find us online at FloridaBeerBlog.com or FloridaBeerPodcast.com. You can reach out to us via email at FloridaBeerBlog at gmail.com. And also make sure to check out the Florida Podcast Network, of which we are a proud member. This clearinghouse of Florida-based podcasts can be found at floridapodcastnetwork.com. You'll find all the latest episodes and information coming from our sister network. If you are listening to us on Stitcher or Apple Music or iHeartRadio, any of those, make sure to like and subscribe to our podcast. And if you can leave a message, that would be even better. Give other people a chance to know all the fun stuff that you know listening to the Florida Beer Podcast. Our intro announcer is Jeff Brozovich. Field producer is Steve Pacala. Executive producer for the Florida Podcast Network and Grant Hypuba is Jemmy Lagonier. This is David Butler, your host and author. We will see you next week in Ocala. Thank you so much for listening and drink Florida Craft. Florida Craft.